Well, happy Friday, happy Friday, happy Friday, everyone. My name is Justin Moore, founder of Creator Wizard, where I teach you how to find and negotiate your dream sponsorships. Excited to be back here for another live stream today. We're going to be talking about spring sponsorship pitching strategies. Are you wanting to lock in some deals for this spring season? Uh, well, you're in the right place because that's all we're going to be talking about today. So uh, I'm going live across YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Twitch, LinkedIn, you name it. I'm there. Uh, and uh, we got Angry Owl Outdoors tuning in already. What's going on? Yeah, so let us know where you're tuning in from. Uh, I've got TikTok open here. We've got uh, Size Spaceship, Kim Pearson. Uh, we've got uh, Kristen. Kristen, uh, I think I see you turning it. Good to see you here. Hiking with Mary. Uh, good to see you here. Um, yeah, we got a lot to cover today. We're already in the middle of February. Not sure how that happened. Um, we've got Fourthborn Child all the way from tuning in from the Philippines. Good to see you here. We've got uh, Brew Baby, Shanny Pants on TikTok. Uh, we've got Carolyn Mickelson tuning in from Chicago. We've got Bianca from my team tuning in. What's up, Bianca? Uh, Titanium Justin. Great name, Justin. Uh, we've got Airborne Camera. What's up, man? Hello from the City of Angels. Good to see you here, dude. All right. So uh, as you know, uh, my weekly live stream uh, every week, I... Uh, I, I, this is for y'all. So uh, whatever questions about brand deals, sponsorships, negotiations that you have, we're going to be answering those a little bit later in the live stream. But today, let's get into the meat of it, which is how are we going to lock in some brands for the spring? Okay, so the first thing that we want to we want to think about is we should probably go back and look at who we worked with last spring. <laughs> so if you've done some brand partnerships before and uh, and you've worked with some you know brands last you know uh, April May time period, the easiest way to get deals for this spring is to convince the brands that you've already worked with that they should hire you again, <laughs> right? A lot of people think that oh I'm just going to work with that brand and then I'll never talk to them again. No, that's not a good idea. They're like oh I'm trying to find another brand, a new brand uh, to partner with. Um, and by the way, it doesn't just have to be brands that you worked with last year, you can go back to brands that you worked with maybe over the holidays and pitch them on, on a spring campaign, right? Um, and so you, you have to look no further than your existing clients. There's this concept that I talk about quite a bit, which is the concept of churn and LTV. And if you're thinking, what the heck is this? Well, I am a little, little bit of a nerd. My background is in computer engineering and in college. And so I, I, I've been around a lot of like software development and, and this type of thing. And so there's these terms that they talk about in the world of SaaS or software as a service called churn and LTV. And what this means, churn is how many customers are you losing each month, right? And so you could think of it, you've got all these kind of like customers or, or clients that are coming into the top of your funnel, right? The top of your bucket, let's call it, right? But if you have all these holes in the bottom of your bucket where your customers, your clients are just kind of leaking out, then you have to get more and more customers into the top of your bucket just to stay afloat, just to have a constant revenue stream. And so your number one priority as a creator should be to plug all the holes in the bottom of your bucket, right? You want to minimize the amount of people who are stop stopping working with you each month. And so how this applies for you as a creator in your business, if you work with brands and sponsors a lot, this is a major way in which you derive revenue, um, then you better prioritize, like continuing to, you know, repitching those brands that you work with every single month or every single quarter, whatever their cadence is for partnerships. And so reducing churn in your creator business is a really important thing. The other really important uh, factor that, uh, that you need to be thinking about is LTV or lifetime value. So it's not just about partnering with one brand once, it's about how can you maximize the value of the relationship over time. So this also has implications on your negotiation philosophy and strategy. So rather than trying to take every single dollar off the table in an initial partnership, right, and like fleece the brand <clears throat> for every penny that they're worth, uh, that you are going to say, okay, you know what, I'm not actually going to, uh, you know, charge you. 10K or whatever, or I'm not going to charge you 15K or whatever. Um, I understand that you have some budget constraints. Let's go for 12.5 or something like that. And then understanding that you you may be able to renew this into something long term where instead of just 15K that you make on one deal, you're actually going to make, you know, let's say 60K over the next year doing quarterly deals. Right. Uh, and so that that's that's challenging sometimes. Right. Because you you see the, the, the dollars, you got the dollar signs in your in your eyes and you're thinking like, oh, that, that's a lot of money. Right. Um, but if you can exercise restraint and have objectivity about, you know, what what you're actually trying to do at the end of the day, which is to make the most amount of money possible over the lifespan of the relationship 
relationship, uh, you're going to be uh, you're going to be uh, like way different than every every other partner that they that they're working with. And so, again, if you're wanting to work with you know some brands for the spring, you have to look no further than people that you've already worked with in the past. Okay. How is this concept of churn and LTV feeling to people? Is this overwhelming? Is this confusing? Uh, Airborne camera here in the chat, uh, one of our Brand Deal Wizard alumni is saying, "Post campaign report." Exactly. This is the this is the way, one of the ways in which you can plug up all of those uh, holes in the bottom of your bucket is to hopefully be generating a report where you go back to the brand rather than just being like when they ask you for screenshots, you go, "Okay, here you go," and you send them attachments of your screenshot. No, you're not going to do that. You're not going to send them that. You're going to you know what? You're going to send them. You're going to send them a comprehensive report that has both quantitative and qualitative insights into there, into how that campaign went. And oh, by the way, I'm also going to pitch you on the next campaign based on the insights from this campaign. All right. And so you're absolutely right. Airborne camera. That's exactly one of the, one of the tactics that we talk about here, uh, at, uh, on, on creator wizard. We've got Raman Razi, uh, tuning in. We've got Delilah Rodriguez. Y'all just want to, we need to give some round of applause for Delilah here because, uh, Delilah uh, is part of our seven day pitch challenge that we're just wrapping up today. And uh, one of the coolest parts about the pitch challenge is that we actually gave away free enrollment to Brand Deal Wizard to one lucky participant of the pitch challenge and Delilah was the lucky winner. So we're very, very excited to have her uh, in the program. And uh, yeah, I couldn't think of a more deserving person, Delilah. So awesome to see you here on the live stream. Um, Delilah says, I'm watching on the big living room TV and my and, and on my phone so I can comment. <laughs> awesome. Uh, uh, Trevor says, how, how can you over deliver to build your brand? Okay. Is that, if that's a question, uh, definitely we'll get to that in, in a bit. We've got Trisha Espinoza. Good to see you here. We've got Trevor, Sarah, Don, what's, what's going on? We got Jenny Lou, uh, Jenny Lou yoga tuning in from New York. Jenny is also a participant in the, uh, the pitch challenge and, uh, congratulations, Jenny, Jenny already heard back from a, from a brand that she pitched. One of the coolest things about, about doing the, the seven day pitch challenge is how quickly some people uh, have been hearing back from the brands that they pitch. And I think it's shocking. I think for, for certain people, some people have even said that I've never heard back from a brand before, before doing this challenge. Um, but when you actually have a strategy behind what you're saying and ensuring that it's actually relevant <laughs> to what's going on in the brand's world, rather than this gigantic ego flex and, and, uh, being like, hi, I'm Justin. I have this many followers. I have this many views collaborate with me. Will you sponsor me? That's, that's not, no, that's not the approach that, <laughs> that you want to have. And so having an actual strategy behind it can make all the difference. So Jenny, congratulations on hearing back from that brand. Really excited for you uh, to uh, to have uh, have that meeting. Trisha said, first time, first time here. Looking forward to listening. Well, glad to have you here, Trisha. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, first of many. Um, let's see here. Uh, we got um, mm, Crystal Prophet. What's going on, Crystal? What's up, Justin? We got Crystal tuning in on IG. Uh, Airborne Camera says, Brand Deal Wizard is awesome. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna screenshot that comment because I appreciate you. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to hear that you <laughs> you find value in it. Um, uh, Hanadi, uh, Hanadi from KMH Family. Yes, I've been able to continue with sponsorships with one of our favorite brands for over a year, almost two years. The post-campaign report definitely helped. Holy moly. Amazing, so proud of you, Hanadi, that's amazing. All right, um, so uh, before we dive into q and I have a few more things I wanna talk about about the uh, spring sponsorship pitching strategy. So the first thing we talked about, remember, was going back and re-pitching brands that you've worked with in the past. Um, and uh, the second thing I wanna talk about is how important it is to know your numbers and to work backwards. So for example, if you want to secure two brand partnerships for spring campaigns, let's assume that you're gonna have a I don't know, 10% success rate right, with your pitches. I can help you get a much higher success rate for that if you were to participate in the seven day pitch challenge or in my course. But uh, for, for that to happen, uh, let's say it's a 10% success rate. You really don't feel like you know much about what you're doing. 10% success rate, what does that mean? Two, if you wanna secure two brand partnerships, that means you're gonna have to pitch 20 brands. And remember, you don't have that much time either because if we're assuming that it takes let's say an average of a month or maybe six weeks to actually finalize the logistics of a partnership, we're already looking at early to mid April 
to actually post the content, which is basically kind of right in the middle of spring shopping season, or maybe even getting closer to the end of spring uh, shopping season for almost all brands. So you gotta hurry up. You have to like be, you know, one of the things you probably have learned about listening to some of my content, watching here, being on these live streams is that you have to be thinking in advance. If we're sitting here in February, we can't be pitching them winter campaigns right now. Those things are always fully fully baked for most for most brands. Um, those things have been like, you know, they plan that out three, six months ago, especially the larger the brand gets, they're planning these things out quite far in advance, right? And so you always have to be thinking ahead. Not only will thinking ahead uh, allow you to have a higher success rate on getting those emails opened, but it also will help you be more thoughtful about your content strategy. Because remember, your audience is probably thinking ahead too. It's not just like relevancy about what's happening right now. And so if you can Think about uh, you know content that you can make that will uh, that you can actually use in your pitches for the brands that you're trying to target for the spring. That also can be really impactful. Another thing about uh, you know uh, nailing down some some spring sponsorships. I've talked about the importance of surveying your audience. Uh, about what their spring plans are. Maybe maybe they're going on you know spring break, vacation, road trips. Uh, maybe they have other sp- spring cleaning. You know, there's c- certain habits and things that people do around the world, usually around the springtime. Uh, you know, and starting to you know the snow is starting to melt off. You know, people are starting to garden. Like there's all sorts of things that people associate with spring activities. Survey your audience and then use the results of that survey to approach the brand for creative ways to market to them. Right. You can even incentivize your audience with a Starbucks or Amazon gift card giveaway or something to actually take it. Right. You can ask uh, them the the brands and products and services that they always buy or use or patronize every spring. And then you can use that as a list of brands to target. Surprise, surprise. And by the way, even if nothing comes out of your pitches, again, you now have a ton of valuable information about your audience and what might resonate with them for future content. Right, we've got furry, furry dog tips and lifestyle tuning in. We've got Tay on TikTok unboxing zero 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 zero. Karen Glennon, good to see you here. Um, we've uh, uh, alongside Aubrey said, "How do we get in the challenge?" Aubrey, I'm so sorry, but the challenge ended, or it's ending today. Actually, enrollment was last week. We started the challenge last uh, last Friday, and it was a seven day challenge, and now it's over. Um, I've actually considered. Uh, creating like maybe an, an evergreen version of the challenge, maybe like a, like a seven day email course or something like that, uh, rather than the, um, you know, the live nature of it. We're we're probably going to do the seven day pitch challenge live again at some point in the future. I don't really know when. Um, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, cause a lot of people have asked me like, Oh, I missed the enrollment window. I'd really love to learn the information. The whole, the whole point of the pitch challenge, by the way, was to create a pitching habit. That was the whole goal is like, how do you develop a repeatable, consistent behavior in your life so that you're, you're all always pitching brands. You're always reaching out because at the end of the day, I, I, I like to say, well, this is a, this is a new thing I've coined. Uh, I, I was, I wrote it as a, as a section of my book recently uh, that I'm working on. Pitching is like breathing. If you stop, you die. <laughs> it, it's the lifeblood of any business worth their salt. You cannot just rely on opportunities coming into your inbox. You cannot sit on your hands and wait for these things to come to you. You have to be out there constantly getting on the radar of these partners that you want to collaborate with. Okay. Um, and so, so yeah, so don't have, uh, don't, don't have it quite yet. Oh, Aubrey, there we go. We got some validation. Aubrey says, yes, drip email, please. It'd be a great uh, lead magnet too. Yes. That's a, that's a great idea. So I think I might uh, try and spin that up. Um, Angry Owl Outdoors says, thanks to these live sessions, I have started working with companies and made my first deal. Holy cow, can we get some applause for Angry Owl Outdoors in the chat? Holy moly. Come on, I got to I got to highlight this this one right here. I'm so proud of you. That's incredible. That's wild. That's so cool. Love to hear it. I love I love these uh these wins. Um Delilah says the 7-day pitch challenge is a freaking genius idea. I'm so glad I got the opportunity to participate. I'm so I'm so happy to hear that uh that uh it's been so cool for you Delilah. You know I'm going to screenshot this comment. You want to know like a little meta behind the scenes thing? Um these okay, here we go. I got to do my face so I can have an awesome face to that. Um 
Uh, oh, a oh, real quick, uh, Angry Owl Outdoors says, I spent an hour on the phone with the head of marketing for a collaboration. He asked my rates. I sent package options with four tiers of deliverables, one week with no reply. Convo was positive. Uh, should I re reach back out to the company? Great question here. Um, so uh, real quick answer um, is, abs don't worry, don't worry. Like he, the, the head of marketing may be talking with other people at the company. Maybe there's a CMO, maybe the CEO probably needs to get, get approvals probably working if he's the head of mark he or she is the head of marketing they're probably working on lots of other projects i wouldn't really worry about it but i absolutely would follow up and uh you know provide some value don't just say hey just want to bring this to the top of your inbox you could say hey i saw this article from Adweek or something that made me think of this conversation that we had just wanted to send this along uh would love to you know let me know if you have any thoughts on the proposal something like that so i talk a lot of more detail about like don't don't just like say oh bringing this to the top of your inbox you all should always should be providing value when you follow up like that but i really wouldn't worry about it People, you know, brands are busy, things are busy, um, but but you do have to stay top of top of mind for them. Okay, um, so yeah, that's a, that's a huge win there. Um, all right, I have uh, one more thing I want to say about um, the spring sponsorship uh, pitching strategies, and then we're going to dive into Q and A. So uh, while I'm talking about this, if you have any questions about working with brands, collaborating, negotiations, brand deals, et cetera, uh, drop it in the chat here because we're gonna get to Q&A shortly. So um, with respect to spring sponsorship strategies, um, if they say no, if you reach out and you pitch them and they say no, don't just take no for an answer and say, okay, please keep me in mind for future opportunities. No, don't say that. Pivot to summer. OK, again, persistence is key here. You cannot give up. A lot of creators just send one pitch email. They don't hear back or maybe they get rejected and then it's a big blow to their egos. You absolutely cannot take things personally. Any number of things could have happened to your email if you got ghosted, right? Maybe it got flagged as flagged as spam. Maybe the contact opened it and forgot to reply. Maybe, you know, they were planning on getting back to you, but they just got super busy. You can't automatically assume the worst, right? And so following up can absolutely be the key to securing those deals. And if they say no, pivot to something else, okay? Because if they've already allocated all their funds for paid campaigns for this for spring or whatever, because it happens, it's only six weeks away. A lot of large brands have fully baked that thing already. That happened six months ago, three months ago, right? That happened in like November or something like that. Again, it depends on every brand in terms of how in advance they plan this type of stuff. Um, but, but absolutely, you cannot give up. It's not no, it's just not yet, okay? So um, so hopefully this guy's got, got the juices flowing for y'all in terms of reaching out, pitching some brands for the spring because this is the time to do it. And if it's not for spring, for summer, if it's not for summer, back to school. If it's not back to school, it's holiday, it's winter. Quick anecdote, the furthest in advance I ever got an RFP. So an RFP is uh, what's called a request for a proposal. So when I when I uh, ran my agency, oftentimes we would get brands who would send us these what are called RFPs, where they're saying, "Hey, we want to work with creators or we want to work with influencers." Um, you know, at a you know at a, at a later date, um, put a proposal together for us of like how you are going to do that. And by the way, they send this RFP to a lot of different. Uh, uh, entities. They, they send this RFP to not just our agency, but a lot of different ones. And so we're kind of fighting in the octagon of like, who's going to be the winner? Who has the best proposal? Who has the most, you know, uh, compelling pitch of, of, uh, of why this brand should work with us? The furthest in advance that we ever got an RFP was 14 months. 14 months. So they reached out to us in January for a campaign the following March. Not, not in two months, like the following March. So some brand, and this was a very large brand. So, so some brands that they, it's crazy. They, they, they really do plan really far in advance. You think it's, it's nuts. So, but it happens. Okay. Um, Crystal says, don't forget the made up holidays that some brands really want to stand out for. Yeah. Oh my God. I like, think about all the national donut day, national small business owner day, national, you know, cat day, national dog day. Like there's so many of these days. Um, that, uh, you know, that, that brands want, they, they run campaigns for, right? Um, so absolutely great, great point there, Crystal. Um, Ryan says, uh, oh, we got Ryan in the chat here. Thanks for all your help during the challenge. Yes, Bianca has been such a huge, uh, huge help. Uh, you know, Bianca is on, on my team um, and uh, she's been such an awesome uh, pro at uh, supporting y'all through the seven day challenge, as well as in the community for Brand Deal Wizard. Um, so, so awesome to see you here, Ryan. And uh, Ryan, I sent you a, I sent you a message uh, just privately. Like I, it always touches my heart to see uh, people who participate in things like this, who are 
really engaged. They're they're not just in it for themselves. They're not just posting, oh, help me, help me. They're on other people's posts. They're commenting. They're providing feedback. It's been my experience that people like you, Ryan, people like you who who really are engaged and, and trying to learn from others as well, um, people like you are the people who see the most success and, and most traction because you're kind of a constant student of, of seeing how even people in other niches or other industries are achieving success. So that's a big part of, of succeeding as a creator, I've found. Um, so uh, we've got Ivan tuning in from TikTok. Uh, grilling, uh, I missed your name, Grilling something. Cambria, um, good to see you here. Um, we've got Des uh, Desire Destiny, Sandchick123. Um, we've got Young King OP. We've got Trey. I am Trey Jack. What's going on, Trey? Good to see you here. We've got Aiken Adventures. Good to see you. I, I believe that we have a one-on-one -on -one scheduled Aiken Adventures. Aiken Adventures referred 25 people to my newsletter. I have like a newsletter referral program where if, where if you share the invite link to my newsletter and you refer different, you know, certain numbers of people, you unlock certain perks. And so Aiken Adventures has, has referred 25 people to my newsletter. So uh, they unlocked a, a free 30 minute one-on-one -on -one with me. So I'm really excited to do that. Good to see you here, man. Um, let's see here. Um, all right. Uh, so, okay, let's, let's jump into some questions here. Um, and so if you have any questions about, uh, sponsorships, brand deals, negotiations, drop it in the chat. All right. Um, okay. I did see a, uh, a question further up. Let me scroll back up. Oh my goodness. Um, Mr. Justin edit says, love your content, dude. I've been binging listening on your YouTube to your YouTube playlist on my run. Boom. I appreciate that. That's so awesome. Mm. Mm. This is the one I missed. Okay. Creator stream, uh, from, from Trevor Tommy on, uh, said, Justin, what industries are newly, newly heavy investors in influencer campaigns so far this year? That's a, it's a really great question, um, Trevor. So I don't necessarily think about it by industry. Every industry is so different in terms of the appetite that they have or the interest that they have in investing in a certain thing. Um, I, can, I can share some anecdotes um, because it's so industry specific. One of my uh, longest time um, uh, coaching clients, his name is Paul. He runs a podcast called The Green Industry Podcast. And his story, I actually have a whole case study uh, that I we interviewed him and, and he told his whole story. It's really interesting. But, you know, he had a lawn care business for the longest time, for seven years. Um, and he he started creating content kind of on a lark, um, you know, and his insight was, you know, People in his industry are are really trying to grow their businesses. They're usually they have you know a handful of of trucks. Maybe it's just them and, and a couple other people on their team. But they really are have all aspirations to grow larger. Maybe you know, have multiple teams and they're servicing larger and larger areas in their in their um, you know town. Um, and so he he started a podcast talking all about like what are the strategies that you can use to grow your your um, lawn care business. And so another insight that he has was that uh, people are on their mowers for all day basically. And so he said, I I'm gonna start a podcast so that you know people can be listening to that. Um, they're, you know, they're not gonna be watching YouTube videos. They're not gonna be watching TikToks. No, they're, they're gonna be on their lawnmower listening to a podcast. And so that's what I'm gonna do. Really fantastic insight, I think, you know? Um, and so his podcast has absolutely exploded, but um, you know, he, Previous to to you know him, uh, a lot of brands started reaching reaching out to him, saying, "Hey, we want to give you free stuff. We'll give you a free mower, or we'll give you a free hedge trimmer, or we'll give you a free stuff, right?" Because they'd never really worked with creators in that capacity where they were actually compensating them. And so when we started working together, we started brainstorming like creative ways that we could actually kind of start cutting through and start educating brands for the value of actually you know having heightened relationships with with creators in that way because there's all sorts of ways in which you can provide value to a brand beyond just you talking about them on your platform right um, and so it took a good probably 12 to 18 months of of Paul just consistently pushing through going to all the industry trade shows you know talking with the big wigs at, the, at these marketing organizations uh, until he finally broke through and then the floodgates open because what can happen sometimes in these niche industries where there's a kind of a handful of big players right um, and then you know kind of a, a smattering of smaller players um, all it takes is one all it takes is one domino to fall of one very large company uh, starting to invest in influencer marketing 
marketing or working with creators for everyone else to kind of look at each other and be like, oh, if that company is doing that, what are we missing? What are, what are they know that we don't? And so then it be, it's like this domino effect. And so now the floodgates have opened and all, a lot of the brands in their industry are, are, are allocating a lot more marketing dollars, a lot more advertising dollars to, um, to working with creators. And so, um, you know, sometimes you may have to be that person at the bleeding edge out there at the forefront, at the leader of the pack, educating these brands, educating these companies who are more traditional, who don't understand the value. And yeah, it may, there may be a lot of, uh, you tire spinning. You may have a lot of calls with these brands and it doesn't leave. It feels like it's leading to dead ends and you're just not, you're doing all this work and it's not, it doesn't really seem like it's, it's, oh, we'll give you free stuff or, oh, you know, this type of thing or, oh, our product is expensive. And so that should be compensation enough. And a lot of these kind of myopic mindsets that brands have about, about partner marketing, right? Like it, it may take a while for you to actually break through, but I, I can tell you multiple, multiple instances of, of people that have, of creators that I've worked with, um, that have, have ultimately broken through because they, they had the long-term vision. They saw the light and they persevered, uh, over time to, uh, to ultimately, uh, you know, really see great results with those brands. So it's less about like specific industries that I'm seeing invest. And it's more just like there's players in each of these niches. Another, another example, I, I think I've shared it before, uh, one, another alumni or uh, ongoing coaching uh, client, his name is Thomas. He he runs a scuba diving YouTube channel. Same thing in scuba diving. You know, most of the brands in that industry, they they were not accustomed to spending, you know, on working with creators or working with partners. Um, and he was out there at the forefront educating and he finally broke through and, and now is seeing seeing a lot of success. So it's less about industry specific and it's more about who who is going to be the person. Is it going to be you? Maybe it's going to be you in your niche, in your industry that um, is the person that ultimately opens the floodgates for everyone else. So um, so great question, Trevor. <clears> hmm. <throat> Okay, so um, got a, got a couple questions here um, uh, coming in. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, y y Yava, uh, y Yava Yava N. I, I I apologize if I'm not I'm not pronouncing your name uh, properly. I'm trying to collaborate with a brand, and they seemed positive, but they're always telling me that they will contact me to tell me when they have decided uh, what they have decided to do, and uh, and they don't. Um, so it, it's kind of like a "don't contact us, we'll contact you" type approach. It sounds like what I'm saying. Um, okay, so here's a, I'm going to give you permission uh, to to do something that may feel a little uncomfortable, which is that just because they tell you that doesn't mean you can't be valuable to them. So the example that I gave previously is like, hey, if you see an article in Adweek or Digiday or some online publication that you think could be really useful and relevant to their brand or their category, you send that over to them. You say, hey, I just saw this article about how this other brand in a similar you know, vertical as you is achieving a lot of success on YouTube or achieving a lot of success with short form content. Um, thought you'd find this interesting, you know, uh, and you and you send that over to them, right? Just because they say that, hey, we'll be in touch with you doesn't mean that you can't continue to provide value. And if you do that consistently, the whole goal is staying top of mind for them, right? A lot of people think that they're annoying brands or they're pissing brands off. And that, that couldn't be further from the truth um, unless they're explicitly saying, don't contact us again. Like, you absolutely can be, uh, you know, ensuring that you're in their inbox. Let's say every four weeks or every six weeks or whatever, continuing to provide value for them. It's not like, hey, do you have anything for me? Hey, do you have any paid work for me? No, it's not about that, right? And this is this is a challenging thing for a lot of creators because they really do think that they're bothering bothering brands. Do, do you have a, any understanding, especially if a marketing team is small, they do not have the time to have their finger on the pulse of what is working and what is happening on social media right now. They do not have the time. And so if you can be their eyes and ears and say, hey, here's this trend that's happening right now. Or, oh, here's this a case study of how this other brand is achieving results. Or, oh, here's a post that I did where I learned something interesting about this market segment, which is what the customers that you're trying to reach, they will appreciate that information. So if you can shift your mindset to like it being an ego stroke and you are pissing off the brand or you're pissing off the agency, no, it's about how can you serve them? How can you provide in interesting information that might spur uh, you know, a, an idea in their mind that they may not have considered previous to that, right? And so, so I think that this is this is what I, I want you to hear. Y Yava um, is is that you know you don't you don't need anyone's permission to to 
provide value to a brand. Unless they're selling you, don't contact us again, um, then it, it should be your permission to to be creative in terms of uh, you know how you're ultimately serving them on a long-term basis, okay? Is that helpful? Um, great question here. Crystal says, if you had a team member help help you in the pitching process, what would be the first thing they could do independently without a lot of oversight? This is a great question, um, Crystal, and it's actually one that I get um, from graduates of, of Brand Deal Wizard, actually, as, as well, because there's a lot of creators that go through the program, and then they say, okay, I know the framework now, I know kind of the strategy of what I need to do, but I really, I'm still very busy, and I still would love to have someone assist me with this process, whether it's the pitching process, or whether it's handling and managing the brand partnership execution and things like this. Um, let's talk specifically about the pitching stuff because um, you know there absolutely is a way to onboard and learn and 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 uh, onboard and delegate and teach someone a trusted member of your team um, how to do that part of it. Um, but I do still think it's very critical that you're involved um, at and basically the the way I, I describe this is that there is a. Uh, a handoff that you can orchestrate. So maybe you do have some inbound deal flow. You have leads, you have inquiries who are brands or partners who are coming inbound, wanting to collaborate with you and so on. And so what I would do is, would be to train this person of what, what, what do you typically do when you get an inbound inquiry? Cause it's usually pretty similar, right? Um, in, in my brand deal wizard uh, program, I teach, there's like a, there's like, uh, you know, pretty similar things that you ask, you, you ask a partner every time that they come inbound, right? It's like, okay, tell me about the goals. Tell me about the deliverables that you're looking for. Tell me about the usage rights. Tell me about the exclusivity requirements. Tell me about what success you know would look like. like there's like this list of things. You know, tell me about the timeline. Tell me about you know, when do you need to see drafts for review. Like there's all these things that you usually ask a partner. And so if you can train someone on your team to be softly, lightly vetting these inbound opportunities to make sure that they're worth your time, and then the brands or the companies ultimately respond to that, and they you know answer this the the with sufficient detail that you feel as though it is an opportunity worth pursuing or worth further vetting, that's when your your uh, person on your team can tag you into the thread. They could say, okay, yeah, this sounds super interesting. Thank you so much. Just tagging Crystal into the thread here and to, to you know, and we'll get a meeting on the books to kind of chat further about how we can bring this partnership to life. So I do think that there's a process kind of an SOP, a standard operating procedure that you can orchestrate such that you can have someone help with the fire hose of, of inquiries that you may be receiving and they can vet, let's say 80% of them. And there may, there's all, in my experience, there's always going to be 10 to 15% of, of opportunities that are going to be required for you as the creator to, to, to somehow vet, or the person on your team is just not really going to know how to respond or not really going to know how to disposition. A great example is I have Bianca on my team. We've been working together now. How many? I can't. I don't know, almost going on six months potentially, Bianca. Um, and so it's been a process of like her learning, kind of what are the things that uh, the opportunities that we want to pursue at Creator Wizard, what are the things that we don't want to. Um, you know, what are the things that? And, and then there's always going to be questions like this one's a little weird. Like, what would you do here, right? And so I think if you 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 can absolutely create that process for yourself in your business. Um, but I, again, I do think that trying to a hundred percent outsource it to someone else is a mistake because, um, the reason that these brands and these partners want to work with you is because of you. It's your special sauce. And so this is also why I talk about a lot that I believe it's a mistake for most creators to try to, uh, you know, outsource this, this, the business stuff to a manager. Um, and so, so that, that's really kind of how I, uh, how I approach this stuff, Crystal. So let me know if that was helpful. Um, by the way, I do want to uh, take a moment here to acknowledge today's sponsor, with, which is Lulu. Um, obviously, uh, you know, Lulu has been a longtime sponsor. Um, and, you know, if you have a library of written posts somewhere, maybe on a blog or maybe a newsletter, or maybe you have a ton of YouTube videos or podcasts where you could download the transcripts, have you ever considered taking the content that you've been working on for years and turning it into a book? You know, just being public, just being a published author lends you a lot of credibility and authority. And this is especially relevant for what I talk about here, right? Because when you publish your own book, you're also telling potential sponsors that you have the knowledge to offer them something uh, really valuable. And so I wanted to um, just share my screen here so you can take a look at um, the uh, Lulu site here. So they have a ton of, of resources on here to help you publish, print, and sell your books 
internationally with print on demand network while eliminating the risk and hassle uh, of inventory and fulfillment. You know, you guys know that I'm working on my forthcoming book, Sponsor Magnet, which is exciting. Can we get some love in the chat here? Can we get to everyone, anyone excited? Okay, if you're excited for my forthcoming book, drop a money tongue emoji in the chat. Drop the money tongue, drop maybe the praise hands, the diamond, the mind blown emoji, because I'm very excited. I've been devoting uh, time every single morning to writing. I'm very excited about it. Um, so if you're excited about Sponsor Magnet, drop it in the chat. Um, but uh, you know, I've been just doing a ton of research about the best ways to actually get it into the hands of my audience, right? And Lulu has a ton of guides and content to help you turn your content into a published book. So um, if you wanna learn more uh, about Lulu, uh, make sure to click the link in the description to check uh, check them out. You can create a free account, um, you know, when you, uh, and because when you support our sponsors, by the way, it helps me continue to bring awesome free content and live streams for you, all right? So can we get some round of, app round of applause for, for Lulu here? Uh, I, like I'm, I'm, I'm very appreciative of their support. Definitely check them out. I'm big fan. They're huge advocates of the creator community and, um, yeah, they link below, check them out. All right. Um, let's get back to it. Um, all right. So questions that y'all might have around sponsorships. Um, oh yeah, I'm loving, I'm loving all the chat. I'm, I'm loving the money tongues emoji. I see Mr. Justin, Justin edits on, on TikTok. We got Lola dropping it on TikTok as well. And I think, I think Instagram here too. Oh, queen fancy plans is getting the. Okay. I'm getting the, I'm getting the clap. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, everyone I'm loving it. Um, we got Sarah, Sarah Loetta. What's up, Sarah? Sarah, good to see you here. We got Sarah in the chat. Um, love it. All right. Mm. Um, Sarah says, I love this little sponsor blurb on the top graphic, stealing it from my own streams. Heck yeah, of course. Yes. The, the getting those, the live stream sponsored is, uh, is kind of a new thing, uh, for, for us, for me here at creator wizard. So it's pretty cool. What do you guys think of this new format? I love, I love, you know, let, okay, let, let's do something pretty meta right now, which is that, you know, when a sponsor comes inbound to me and they want to work with, with me at creator wizard, like Lulu, for example, when we when we forged the initial deal with Lulu, it was it was newsletter focused, right? So we were doing placements in in our newsletter. If you're not on our newsletter, by the way, creatorwizard.com slash join. What are you doing if you're not on it? There's 36,000 creators on there getting sponsorship opportunities delivered to them on a silver platter every single week for free. Anyways, um, and uh, and and newsletter sponsorships that was the primary thing that we um, we uh, you know uh, the collaboration that we forged with them initially. When we ultimately came back to have a renewal conversation with Lulu, we listened to them. We asked them about their objectives. What are the what are your objectives, Lulu, for 2024? And uh, a lot of one of the things that they said is that we want to explore some new content formats. We are interested in YouTube. We're interested in kind of longer form content. We haven't really done a bit a ton of it before, but we're interested. Like, what do you have for us? Essentially, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, we had done a few you know, YouTube integrations in the past, but we hadn't really ever done much in terms of live stream sponsorships. And we, and so we, we, you know, we got, got to talking about all the different content formats that we have in the live stream. They, they perked up. They said, Oh yeah, the live stream, that, that sounds cool. Like we, you know, having our logo in the, you know, from a brand awareness perspective throughout the entirety of the live stream, um, you know, having a kind of a, a sponsor plug in the middle of the live stream, just like I, just like I did. Um, that seems interesting. And so there we go. We had a new content format that we were able to offer to a sponsor because that's what they were looking for. And so this is a big insight, I hope, for a lot of creators who are listening here is that a big, a big part of what I teach about my negotiation philosophy is having creativity when it comes like throughout the pitching and negotiation process, because um, you may just be able to invent something to invent something that gets the deal over the finish line for this particular brand. They may have either never done it before, you may have never done it before, but hey, it's in perfect alignment with a way in which you can serve your audience, A, as well as serve uh, you know, potential brand partner to expose them to their ideal potential customer, right? Um, and so I think I, I, I've shared a few anecdotes here about like how you can be creative to offer new sponsorship formats of things that you've never done before. And that may be the thing that ultimately seals the deal. So how are we feeling? Are we feeling this is kind of a, a cool meta um, meta session, meta um, point? The other thing that I wanna do, I, I have, I am trying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to ask some of my long-term sponsors if someone from their marketing team will let me interview them. Cause I, I wanna do an interview of like, 
having them roast my own negotiation that I had with them and be like, hey, how did I do? <laughs> right. Or like, or or even talk about what is their philosophy around hiring partners? Because that that's also, I think, kind of an interesting thing. I don't think we get much perspective as creators sometimes, like what is going on in the mind of brands? Like, what are they thinking about? What are they caring about? Obviously, you know, when I ran an agency, that's one of the whole reasons why I started Creator Wizard was because I had a lot of insights and experience working with brands kind of behind the scenes and, and hearing these conversations that they were having of being like, okay, let's hire that person. But like, no, we're never hiring that person. Like, you know, there's like reasons that they're saying, oh, I don't want to hire that person. Right. And so that's honestly why I started creating this content to begin with. And so, but now that I'm in this kind of a position where I do have a larger platform, I think it would be kind of cool to bring on some, you know, directors of marketing and, you know, direct influencer marketing managers and people at least like prominent companies and kind of, you know, get their perspective on like how they, how and why they decide to, to, to work with people. So would that be interesting? Let me know in the chat, give me some validation. Is that anything that anyone would be interested in? Because I think, I think that would be kind of cool, uh, to, uh, to, uh, you know, hear what people have to say. Uh, yeah, yes. Would love to hear the brands, uh, brand side. Uh, yeah, okay. Get some, some validation. Creator stream says, please do this. Yes. Hell yeah. Okay. There we go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, love to hear that there's some validation here. Um, Ryan says, yeah, especially looking through jobs offered by the brand to see what their objectives are and matching that with your skills. You know, um, this is one thing that we 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 talked about actually a little bit in the uh, in the seven day pitch challenge that we are just concluding um, is how valuable like when you're doing research on a brand trying to decide what to actually pitch them. Oftentimes you stumble upon job descriptions where it's like influencer marketing managers that they're recruiting for or content marketing or influencer coordinators or like some of these titles where maybe the the, the job they hired it already and, and it's closed they're no longer accepting applications but you can learn so much from reading through these like past job descriptions of like what of what like getting insights into their influencer marketing strategy they say in the job description here's what this person is going to do where we're, this person will help us do xyz this person will help us do abc right and so when you ultimately reach out to that brand you better be saying that you better be saying hey i can help you do abc or hey i can help you do xyz because clearly they just told you what their strategy is two months ago or three months ago when they posted that job description right um and so yeah i, I there's all these little nuggets that you can learn from from analyzing these job descriptions and getting into the psyche of like of, of why brands are doing influencer marketing to begin with okay we've got crailer made christian tuning in on the chat what's up dude how do you handle when a brand just wants to get a feel for what sponsorships cost when you are avoiding sending them a menu of pricing this is a really difficult topic um christian and um the way in which i i typically because even i even i get you know even my wife and i or even through creator wizard oh j just send us give me a, give us a ballpark give it give us kind of what are your standard rates like send us your rate card or send us your media kit and just we just want to get a feel for like you know what it would cost and my answer 100% of the time, Christian, and this is a tough one, is I do not have standard rates. Every deal I do is bespoke based on your objectives. Um, and so, you know, th th this is a tough conversation because it is going to potentially mean walking away from business sometimes. If a brand is just dead set and they just want to like collect everyone's rates and they're just going to kind of pick and choose all a cart of, of, uh, of, you know, of how they're, you know, the, the partners that are going to be feasible to work with. Um, then, then this is going to be a tough thing. You may have to walk away from, from business. If the brand says, well, you got to either send it or we can't work with you. That's going to be a tough one. However, what I will say though, is that there absolutely are scenarios where you are going to have to, if you, if you really do want to get a deal across the finish line with this brand or, or, or potentially entertain working with them, especially if they're a dream brand, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to send a number. Um, and Usually what I say in those scenarios, if the brand will simply not tell you what their budget range is, because there's things that you can say to try to uh, ascertain what the brand's budget ranges, at least, if they simply will not tell you they're being completely like poker face and they won't say anything, um, you have to pick what I call your hell yeah number, <laughs> right? So meaning that if you are going, if you do learn a little bit about what their objectives are um, and uh, you know you feel comfortable putting together a proposal for them, um, you know, let's say it's three, four, five packages, package one has to be your hell yeah number. It has to be the number where you're feeling, okay, even if they pick package one, I'm gonna say, hell yeah, let's do this. I'm excited about this. Because a mistake that a lot of creators make is they package one, the the, the dollar value that they assign to package one is like, like 
500 bucks, a thousand bucks, a threshold by which they're hoping, they're hoping that the brand just doesn't pick that. And then the brand picks it and they're like, oh, now I got to do it. And they, they, they come to resent it. Um, and so, so that's what you really want to avoid. And so you have to make your, that, that decision for yourself ultimately, uh, whether, uh, you know, you want to, you know, provide rates to a brand like that. In fact, I just submitted a proposal recently for a brand where I was in a similar situation, Christian, they just, they were kind of poker face. They wouldn't really share. And so I put to put a hell yeah proposal together. And I said, if, if the brand, you know, goes with this, like I'm feeling good about this. And, and if they don't, I'm also good with that. Right. And so I think it, it just comes down to a judgment call that you have to make about that particular sponsor. Yeah. Hope that helps. Let's see. We got some questions here from IG. Petite Mama Life says, Justin, help. What what can I respond uh, to this big cruise ship company if they're asking for my audience demographics, uh, though I want to work with them for uh, their UGC content? I don't have a huge following. Um, this is a good question. So there's two things that, there's two reasons that this sometimes happens. Number one, a lot of brands it becomes part of their process. Maybe it's the creator partnerships, influencer manager, coordinator or something. Uh, they just ask for demographics for everyone. Do they actually make decisions based on the data? Maybe not always, but they just ask it for every partner. Just like, hey, send us your stats, your metrics and send us your media kit. Like sometimes they just like, it's like the standard procedure. We just ask everyone for it, right? So that's one thing that could be a reason. And so you, maybe you're overthinking it. Maybe you just send it to them. Like, don't worry about it. You know, they may not ultimately make the decision based on that. Another reason that they may be asking that, asking you for that is even though you may not be posting the content on your platform, they still want to feel as though you are are a voice that can capably speak to that demographic. The way in which you deliver content, the way, in, you know, uh, you know, they're looking at your platform as a, uh, almost your portfolio. They're looking at your platform as evidence that you can speak to the audience they want to, even though what you'll ultimately pitch them is UGC. So does that help? Like, I, I think that you don't need to overthink it, even though you don't have a super large following. Um, I would say you can, you still have some data on your demographics and you can share that with them, but really you should be looking at your platform as your portfolio and just kind of be clear to them when you, when you ultimately submit that to them. Is that helpful? Yeah, that, that's kind of where I would, uh, that's, that's where I would, um, uh, think about that. Mm. Really interesting question here from Technicolor. Is your course good for nonprofits? I'm going to be totally honest with you. I am starting to get this question more often. I, I it's not something that I've been <laughs> like, I, I, I totally honestly is I didn't create the course like specifically for like, I'm going to make this for nonprofits, but I've been getting this question more and more because to your point, um, sponsorships is a major way in which a lot of nonprofits uh, derive revenue. In fact, I was just corresponding with someone in the DMs on Twitter uh, who is uh, going to be booking a, a, a coaching call who also has a nonprofit. And, um, you know, the more I've thought about this, the more I think a hundred percent that the, the philosophy that I teach around ensuring that what you pitch a corporate sponsor, let's say for your nonprofit is aligned with their own initiatives. Um, that is a game changer because I think what a lot of nonprofits, the trap that a lot of nonprofits get into is that they are trying to, um, convince the brand to use almost like charitable dollars to sponsor them. They're saying like, oh, it's like a kind of a, a give back initiative or, or use your DEI dollars to, to sponsor our charity or use your kind of charitable dollars where they, you know, they devote one, two, 3% of their annual, you know, revenue to charitable initiatives. Please carve out a sponsorship out of that budget for us. <clears throat> and I actually think that's not an effective strategy. I actually think the more effective strategy for trying to get sponsorships for a nonprofit is to help that corporate sponsor or help that brand understand how you as a nonprofit, how you as an organization can help them accomplish a business objective by sponsoring you. So what do I mean by this? So maybe the brand has some new product that they're launching or a new feature that they're launching that they really wanna spread the word about. How can you help them understand that sponsoring your nonprofit allows, helps them accomplish that business outcome. That's a really different conversation because then that potentially could unlock different budgets. So if that person that can go to their superior and be like, hey, I know this is a nonprofit, but they're saying that you know at this gala that they're doing or they have a newsletter with 50,000 people that they're gonna talk about uh, you know, our corporate sponsorship, but also the fact that we have this 
uh, initiative or this new feature, this new brand that, product that we're launching, they're going to talk about that as part of the sponsorship of their organization. That's a much different conversation. And so you may be able to unlock either different dollars, different budgetary dollars or larger dollars, because now it's clear to them of why they're sponsoring you. It's not a handout from a charitable perspective anymore. It's a, uh, helping them accomplish a, a, an objective that they have in their organization. So, um, to be honest, I would not have thought I would given you have given you that answer had you come to me two years ago or three years ago. But the more that I work to pe work with people and the more I understand how universal this this the methodology that I teach is, I think the answer is yes. And so I, I do, you know, I'll be honest, like there's definitely, uh, you know, areas of the program that are, uh, you know, focused on kind of social media type activations or podcasts or newsletters and things like that um, that are for profit. Um, but I do think absolutely that um, it's uh, it's definitely universal. Universal, the, the sponsorship methodology that I teach. If it's, it's, it's very much about accomplishing business outcomes. So, um, if that, if that helps, uh, hopefully, hopefully it does. Uh, petite mama life said, thank you, Justin overthink that for, for sure. Most, most of the time, but thank you for giving me your point of view, uh, more powers. Absolutely. Hopefully it's helpful. <clears throat> um, Ryan says, um, writing, writing, appreciate this insight. Of course, of course. Technicolor says, that's a great and insightful response. Thanks so much. Of course, of course. Um, and, you know, again, I have like so many free videos on my YouTube channel, um, like talking, kind of doing public coaching calls with people. Um, one video in particular, Technicolor, I don't know your name and I apologize for not to, uh, I can't see it with your username here, but there's a, there's a video I have on my YouTube channel called How to Get Sponsors for Your Event or Conference. I would really encourage you to watch that one because, um, I think people who have conferences have a similar trap to nonprofits uh, in that the sponsorship oftentimes for the conference or the event is very amorphous. It's just like pick the silver, bronze, or gold package, right? And it's just like very, it's 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 this very amorphous thing of like, what am I, the brand is thinking like, what am I even getting for the dollars that I'm spending here, right? And uh, and so I think I think that'll be maybe unlock some some insights for you uh, as well. So make make sure to check that one out. Good luck. Um, all right here. There's a bunch of questions that I missed a little bit higher up here. Um, let's see here. Mm. Your authenticity in this platform can't be understated or overloved. All the love. I appreciate that so much, Trevor. That means a lot, man. Um, let's see here. Oh. Uh, where did I miss it? We've got John Riggs tuning in in the chat. Good to see you here. Um, oh, uh, Jenny has a question here. Um, what do you say when you ask the brand what their goals are and they tell you everything, <laughs> meaning increased reach, boost awareness, and conversions? Oh, I love this question, Jenny. Thanks for asking it. Um, this is a really common thing that happens. A brand, you'll be reaching, you'll be interacting with them, talking with them. Um, hey, what, what what would a win look like for you? What would success look? And they say, oh, all these things, all those things you mentioned. Yeah, reach, getting to repurpose your content. That's awesome. Uh, converting, getting sales, like that's all great. And so this is your opportunity to put on your consultant hat, put on your educator hat and sit them down, put your hand on their shoulder, not in a non-condescending fashion and say, look, it's not that simple. Okay. Let's talk about, uh, the difference tactically between a, an awareness activation, an awareness goal and a conversion goal. Okay. When you are doing an awareness activation, um, the goal there is impressions, it's eyeballs, it's views, it's helping your audience start associating a brand or a product or a service with a particular problem. So every time your audience, you know, starts hearing and thinking about a particular thing, they associate it with that particular brand's name or that product, right? And so the way in which you tactically execute an awareness campaign is different. Probably what you're doing is you're saying, Thanks so much to Brand X for sponsoring this episode. And then you may not even talk about them again. You know what another awareness tactic is? Your, your podcast cover art powered by brand on the cover art of that podcast. That is an awareness play. You know what's also an awareness play? Today's sponsor, Lulu, with their logo watermark on this episode, right? You For an awareness campaign, you may not even have a link in the description or a link in the show notes. It's possible. 
right? Let's contrast that with a conversion campaign. What are you doing in that contact content? What are you doing as a direct response tactic? You're saying, click the link in the description box, use my promo code creatorwizard20 for 20% off your first purchase of Athletic Greens or something. That is a direct response conversion focused tactic. So the way in which you tactically execute that sponsorship is going to change. And so this is a conversation that you need to have with your sponsor. You sit them down and say, hey, if that's the case, we probably need to do three to four to five different activations so that we can accomplish multiple different things. Remember, awareness is very top of funnel. That's very top of funnel. If you want my content to repurpose, yeah, that's probably going to be more like a middle of funnel tactic where you're going to be doing, able to you know, get that content reposted on your social platforms, maybe run paid advertising with it, maybe do retargeting, right? The whole goal of this is to pull pe people further down the funnel. And so, yeah, maybe conversion. Yeah, we're going to have some activations that are total like bottom of funnel here, um, but we're going to have maybe one to two of the things that we do. Um, as part of, as part of that tactic. And so it's, 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 it's a really, really important conversation to have with the sponsor because they may have never thought of that, especially if they're a smaller team and they haven't done a ton of activations with creators. Again, like I think the whole theme that I hope everyone listening here realizes is that brands don't have it all figured out. We think they do, but they don't. Oftentimes as creators, we have a much better feel on what's working on social media, right? The trends, what the algorithms are responding to. You also have a much better feel for the pulse of your audience. This is, this is a mind-blowing thing to a lot of creators to think about, but like a lot of brands do not talk to their customers. <laughs> they very, very rarely interact with their customers. And so if you can share audience insights with them of like things that people have directly commented or conversations you've had in the DMs or responses that you've gotten on, on emails or whatever, um, like that might blow their mind. That might blow their minds because they've never, they've never really done that before. And so just do not underestimate the power of, uh, and the knowledge that you've built, the expertise that you've built over your time on social media or podcast or newsletter, whatever it is, wherever your platform is, don't underestimate that because you absolutely can educate them. And so, so yeah, there may be some, I, I tweeted recently that um, I walked away from a $5,000 deal because the brand had unrealistic ex conversion expectations. I walked away from it and I said, you know, do not take the brand's money if you know that it's going to end poorly. It's a hard thing to do. I realize, but like, in the grand scheme of things, um, someone someone commented on that, and I really love this. She said, some money is too expensive. I love that. Some money is too expensive. So how does that, how does that what, what is that, when you, when, does that resonate with you? Have you ever done a deal where you like took the money, you did the deal, and then it was like the biggest pain in the butt deal, and you're like, oh my God, I, I'm never doing that again, or I'm never working with that brand again, or I'm changing this about the way I do partnerships next time. Um, have you ever had that happen? Yeah. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. All right. Petite Mama Life says goosebumps. Yeah, I love that. Some money is too expensive. Yeah. Mm. Jenny said, this is so helpful. Definitely feels like that brand doesn't have this figured out. 100%. Yeah. Bianca says some money is too expensive. Boom. Yeah. You got the mind blown emoji there. I had the same reaction when I, when I heard that. Um, Ryan says, um, they may eventually lead to conversion sales, but, uh, gets the brand or the, or the brand's new product on the radar more than they, than the actual sale at the moment. Yeah. You know, there's this concept that I talk about in my brand deal wizard program called the marketing rule of seven. It's a, an adage that was developed by the movie studios back in the 1930s where they, they did some research and realized that, um, the average moviegoer had to see the um, marketing message about the movie seven times before they finally bought a ticket and got their butt in the seat. And so this absolutely can apply to you as a creator and, and, and it's something that you can educate brands and, and you know, any, any marketer or any brand worth their salt should know this stuff, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're pretty myopic about the, you know, the advertising strategies that they employ. You, you have to understand something. It's very important for you to understand this. Marketers oftentimes are comparing you to other tactics that they're doing. So if they're spending $50,000 a month on Facebook ads or Google pay-per-click ads or, or whatever, let's say $5,000, $5,000 a month on those types of tactics, they 
especially if they've been doing it for a long time, they have quite a bit of data to know that if they pour, let's say $5,000 into the meta ads black box, they know that they're gonna get 10K or 15K on the other side of that, a two or three X or whatever the return is, they know it's somewhat predictable within a margin of error. And so they're thinking in their head, okay, if we if we pay you 5K, are you gonna get us 10K in sales or 15K in sales? <laughs> that if, if they're not, sometimes they'll say that to you, but sometimes they won't, that they'll just be thinking it. And so it's your job oftentimes, especially for smaller to medium sized advertisers to help them understand that the value that you bring to the table is not just about conversions. It's not just going to be about that. And by the way, if they are being myopic about that, you better be changing up to your pitch and saying, Hey, Oh, good to know that, uh, running ads on Facebook and Instagram and, and Google is like a big part of your strategy. Hey, guess what? I can help you make more compelling ads. That's what you pitch because that is a language they'll understand. They'll say, oh, okay, so if we pay this person $5,000, we will get a more efficient ad spend. Okay, let's do that. Is that helpful? Emma, what's going on, Emma? Emma says, uh, I had this exactly th this exact thing happen. Somebody comparing me to the cost per sale on Facebook ads. Yeah, it, it, this is th th if they're not telling you this, they're thinking it. I guarantee it. So you have to understand that, that this is this is what you're combating here. Okay. Um, we're almost at time here, but I do want to get to one more question here from from Hale's Kitchen. Um Question again on pitching live at trade shows or blogger conferences for a recipe content creator. Yes or no, and if it's a yes, any tips? Okay, I have this, um, okay, I absolutely would recommend that you go watch that uh, video that I mentioned on my YouTube channel called How to Get, um, oh, sorry, sorry, it's, uh, let me get the title. It's called Why Traditional Brands Are Not Sponsoring You. I think that's what it's called. Let me just pull up my YouTube channel to see. It's called, uh, uh, why traditional brands aren't sponsoring you. Yeah. So about halfway through that video, Hale, I talk about, um, this creator had a, a very specific, similar question to you, which is like, I'm going to this conference. What do I do or say? And I talk in detail about specific things that you can do. The, 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 the quick answer is don't make it all about you. Don't say, hi, I'm a content creator. I'm a recipe content creator. Work with me. Here's my card because that's what everyone's going to be doing. Okay. Your job before you go to this conference is to research the initiatives that the brands and the companies that are going to be there, what are they working on? What is on their roadmap? So that when you go up to them at that conference, you have already done research and you say, Hey, I saw that you're coming out with this product. Tell me more about that. Or if you can't figure it out, um, ask them, that's the question that you lead with. What, like, tell me about what your goals are, what are your objectives for the rest of the year? That's what you lead with. And then it's going to only naturally seg into what you do, okay? That's just like a quick answer, because uh, but but go back and watch that video. Why traditional brands aren't sponsoring you on my YouTube channel? That's gonna be um, that's gonna be helpful. Justin is the only creator who has made me go get my dictionary to look something up. <laughs> Delilah, what word did I say that made you go get the dictionary? That's really funny. I appreciate that. Emma says, if anybody is reading and considering Justin's course, do it one hundred percent. It's the best decision I've made in years. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emma. That's so. That's so kind of you. My God, I can't think, tell you how much I appreciate that. I'm just, you know, I'm going to pull that comment up. You know, I, it, it always got me on my feels here. Like, <laughs> oh, man, got me in my feels here, Emma. I appreciate that. Myopic was the word. I got you. I got you. Um, but appreciate that so much. Um, let's see. Uh, Ryan had, okay, one more question from Ryan. What is the best way to approach a brand with the hope that they'll grow with you? Buy low and sell high uh, concept. Well, is, is, is your, is your hope mean when you, when you say they'll grow with you, meaning that you'll hope that like both you guys will help each other grow audience wise, revenue wise, you'll hope you'll, they'll start paying you more as things grow, this type of thing. Or is that what your question is? Or is your question, uh, offering them a lower amount in the beginning, like a trial rate with the hope that as things grow, they'll start compensating you more. That's, that's a different question. So, um, yeah, let me know, uh, let me know what, what you mean. Uh, Delilah says, um, I'm 56% into the course and loving it. Love it. Awesome. <laughs> Love to see that you hear that you're getting value already, man. You're, you're really, you're really binging it already. Love to hear that Delilah. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Ryan says, no, a more, more a partnership that grows together. Um, okay. So it's possible. It's possible that you could find a brand who would be open to that. However, 
Um, it's been my experience that a lot of brands have shiny object syndrome. They get really distracted oftentimes. It, it, it sometimes is very hard for them to see a strategy through for a long time period. Um, and for them to, it, 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 let me let me rephrase. That type of relationship or a partnership to grow like that requires one person going to bat for you internally substantially and to some degree putting their credibility on the line. Um, and this oftentimes is something that a lot of people are not willing to do. Um, it requires them to be like, no, we need to forge this like long-term partnership with Ryan. We need to do this because it's going to help both of us grow. It's going to be awesome. Um, and, um, you know, the chances of a brand contact feeling so strongly about you, uh, that they're willing to put again, their credibility on the line to their superior is rare. I have found, um, I would say it's more likely that you'll find a brand who has already proven out influencer marketing or working with creators as a scalable tactic for their organization, meaning that they're kind of medium, medium size, um, that, and they're, they're spending money consistently on working with partners. Um, like those are the people who it's more likely you could develop that type of relationship with because they, again, they see the value in investing in partners over the long haul. Um, it's just, it's just, it's more risky. Like, you know, if, if, if working with partners is not something that they've done really much, investing probably is going to be a large percentage of their, of their marketing spend on a handful of people, either you or like two other people. And then for it to not work out, the stakes are just higher. So again, it's not impossible, but, um, it's, it's rare. It is the real answer. So hope that helps. Um, Dan says update from me. Dan was in the seven day pitch challenge. I just had a very promising initial meeting with the first brand I pitched after going through the pitch challenge. They love the idea of me producing a video for them. Dan, guys, come on. Let's get some round of applause here from Dan in the chat here. This is insane. This is super insane. Dan, holy cow. I am so, so proud of you, dude. This is incredible. I had to pull your comment up because that requires a uh, round of applause, man. This stuff works, guys. I'm not just making this stuff up. These are not plants in the chat. Dan, are you a plant? Ryan, are you a plant? Emma, any of you who have gone through any of the things I've done, are you plants? I don't think you're plants. This is real stuff. I'm trying to empower y'all. This is about you. It's not about me. Okay? I'm so proud of you guys. Like, honestly, it brings a tear to my eye. Uh... Goodness. Um, the Dan says, I'm real. I'm real, says Dan. All right, we got proof here that he's real. Um, anyways, thank you guys so much for for showing up each and every uh week for these live streams. Um, oh, Bianca, if you're still here, do I need to I think I need to make an announcement today? Is it is it today that I need to make the announcement? Uh, or is it next week? B tell me, Bianca, is it okay? Uh, let me just make the announcement and you can let me know, Bianca. Um I'm changing my live stream time, guys. Um, I am going to be changing my uh, live stream time. Oh, she says not today. I mean, I'm going to say it anyways. Um, okay, so as I mentioned, you know, I'm writing my book and I'm all about habits. Yeah, I, I for the seven day pitch challenge, I, um, uh, you know, I shared that uh, a big part of like, developing a pitching habit is uh, creating a routine and doing it consistently, right? Well, I, I'm, I, I live what I, what I teach and I'm writing my book and a big part of writing the book is developing a writing habit. And that's not a habit that I previously had. Um, I, you know, I, I would write, you know, now and then, but I, it was never something that I did, uh, consistently. And so, you know, parting of part of writing a book and having a manuscript done when I say it's going to be done, um, is I have to write a certain amount every single day. It's just the way it is, right? And so that means I found that, you know, carving out time in the morning, creating a writing block for myself is the way that I need to do it to be able to stick with that habit. And so that has required a very heroic effort from Bianca on my team to completely re rearrange all of my schedule. Um, and so part of that means that I'm no longer gonna be able to do my, my live stream on Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. So um, moving forward, not next week I will be doing the live stream at the same time on at 10 a.m. But after that, um, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Bianca can tell, tell me what it, when it is, Bianca, I think it's Tuesdays, but I don't want to misspeak, but we're, we're going to be changing the time is, is basically what I'm, what I'm uh, saying. And so I will be announcing like when it's going to be moving forward, but we are going to be changing the time for the live streams. And so 
you know, I apologize if that screws up any of the habits that you've built for y'all, for yourselves, um, uh, you know, uh, over over the last number of years. I've been doing this Friday live stream for, ah, man, almost, uh, I've been doing the live stream for three years now, but I've been doing the Friday spot um, uh, like at 10 a.m. for almost two years now. So I know it's going to screw up uh, some people's schedules, but I hope you appreciate the grace here that I, you have to, if you want to make changes in your life, if you want to accomplish big things, you have to be willing to uh, make changes. And that's kind of scary. I'm a little scared about changing the live stream time because I've been doing it for so long. I see all of you every Friday and it's become kind of a Friday thing and all this stuff too. But yeah, we are going to be moving it to, um, to Tuesdays. Um, and so uh, until I can get the book done at least. So anyways, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll announce it with the, the new time and everything too. But um, anyways, Appreciate you all. Hope you have a wonderful weekend and uh, I'll see you all on the flip side. Peace. Oh, and real quickly, thank you so much again to today's sponsor, Lulu. Please make sure to check them out. Click that link uh, in the description. Check them out. Create a few free account. All of y'all are authors here. You realize that, right? All of you have a book within you. I 100% believe that. And so get that going. All right. Talk to you soon. Peace.